Library. We're back with Tom Hallway for the with the Oral History Project of the East Ham Historical Society. And the date is still December 2nd, 2023. Uh, Rick, you have some questions. Yeah, Tommy. Uh, well, you just talked about baseball, but uh, I don't think we talked about when did you graduate from high school? And, uh, and when I met you, I know your father had hallway oil. Right. And he had the tanks in Provincetown. And you, you were scalping on uh, the Little Infant. Yep, yep. Out of Provincetown, like Gerald Coster owned. Yep. I had to fuel the boat. And that's how we met, actually. Okay. And uh, you used to go scalping. George Adams was a skipper for a while, and I think Buddy Payne was, too, yep. at times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you guys would go off show for 10 days. I'm back, and I'd fuel you guys up after you take out your scalps. Yep. And uh, yeah, so that was that was quite a thing. Well, I worked for my dad. What year did you, you graduate? I graduated in 1951. Okay. But I never started working with my dad for a number of years because I worked for a landscape, a Semla Haunt in Truro. And uh, he has a contract to mow the state road from all east to Provincetown. And you're looking at the guy that did it for two years while he has a contract alone with one tractor. Is that the same as Horton's campground? Who? Horton? Yeah. He owned that too. So, okay. Yes. Yeah. He had a he had a he had a uh, dairy farm there when he was started. And then he went out of the dairy business. But as a kid, I was a milkman when I was like twelve years old. I used to help the milkman. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I got Highland Dairy milk bottle right up there in that shelf over there. I'll show you. But anyway, um, yeah, I worked for someone. I mean, when he uh, got out of the uh, dairy business, he had a landscape business. And of course, he had a trailer park. I, I, I dug more six foot cesspools than you could count on anything. You know, I mean, and that was, it wasn't any easy chore because up there you got the Highland clay and gravel. And if you're lucky if you could do one and a half cesspools in a, in a day because it was so yeah. hard digging. And we were digging on a machine, we were digging by hand. And uh, a six foot cesspool, finally, he got a rubber tired front loader. And I said, Sumner, I said, you know, there's got to be an easier way to do this. I said, well, how about if I take the front end loader, keep digging on an angle down to where I got to go for the depth, you know, so I can still back out with the stuff in the bucket and take that out of there. And then we'll lay the six foot cesspool in there, the blocks, and then I will backfill it with coarse sand and not the clay and gravel for percolation so the stuff would go off into the ground. So that's what we did. Mm -hmm. um, I could do three or four in a day mm -hmm. for the machine. Mm -hmm. You're lucky you did one and a half by hand. And uh, that trailer park was just unbelievable. When it first started, you could drive up South Hollow Road, had the lights up into the field, and that was the lower pasture. There'd be 25 or 30 deer grazing there at night, every night. Wow. And you know, Billy Madden, the game one, used to camp out up there hoping he could catch somebody trying to shoot him. <laughs> and Billy was a tough old guy, so I liked him. He, he was, was the only one on the Cape, wasn't That's he? That's right. Yeah. That's right. And he traveled all over the place. He was a great guy. He and my dad are good friends. And, uh, but I worked for my dad. Uh, I went from, I, I mowed State Road, and I used to go down uh, to the uh, Provincetown Airport, would hire us for me to get down and mow both sides of the runway and a tie down. So we didn't have a low bed. I had to steam at sixth gear with that old farm tractor. It was a 1938 John Deere. And I would drive down from Haunts. It took me an hour and 20 minutes to get there. Hmm. From Haunts to Barn, yeah. Pete on the airport. So I had to mow both sides of the runway. Of course, you got runway lights about this high. And uh, this is with a track with a sickle bar. You know what a sickle bar is? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I had to do is I'd, I'd go along with the thing down and mow, and then I'd go lift it up and over the light and then down and keep doing this on both sides of the runway. Okay, so I'm paying attention, 
and a plain land and he blew a tire. Well, when he blew the tire, his wingtip missed my head by about this much. Ooh. That's the well, closest I come to getting killed. Yeah. And of course the pilot boy comes running out all like Paul Are you okay? I said, well, I don't see my head on the ground <laughs> yet. <laughs> but I remember that like it was yesterday. And you know that place, I don't know why, the, uh, the state years ago planted all this scotch for them out there, but there were hundreds of praying mantis. I don't know where they came from, but my God, they were like, like locusts. Mm. They were everywhere. Oh. And uh, so I used to do that every year when I worked for hunting. And of course I used to plow gardens. I'd go out and plow a whole bunch in Truro and Walfley and go back and get the harrows on and go back and harrow them all. How'd you get mowing golf courses? I know you did oh, that. Oh, well, I, I, that would happen later years. When I got through working for Ken Wood that bought my dad's oil business out, uh, I ran a swordfish boat for Bob Phipps. And he lived here in East Ham. He had the wood chip factory down here. That was his. So the Derrida, the 47 foot, custom built for swordfish. And um, his father had it, it was built in Sandusky, Ohio. So this thing was just beautiful boat. So when I got through my 10 year contract with Ken Wood was up, and that's how my father got paid off for a period of 10 years. And I was there protecting my folk's interest because if the people left, they didn't have to pay anything. So I stayed there, as long as I stayed there. When I left, everybody left. <laughs> so uh, Bob says to me, Bob Phipps, who owned wood chips, my good friend. Bob said, what are you going to do now, son? You got no job. I said, well, I'm not really sure. He said, listen, how about you and me going jigging cod out of Chatham? And his son Roger was a mechanic at Oyster River Boat Yard. So we had a place to keep the boat. He had a 25 foot boat. And we went out of there, chicken and cod. It was, and that was 1982. Okay. So we go over there. This is in April. We go over there. My neighbor, I was living, I was married to Sandy living in Shoots of Trailer Park in Wallfleet. And my neighbor was dragging sea skulls outside of Chatham. He said, Tommy, you gotta come out to where I'm dragging because I'm getting codfish in the skull break. Hmm. So we went out there, he gave us the numbers, how to get there. We went out there and he was dragging and shucking so all his guts is just going all over the place, dropping down. And we had a Cytex paper machine. You could see those fish just with their mouths wide open, just gulping that stuff down. Mm -hmm. Well, two and a half hours, we had 2,000 pounds of codfish in that boat. Wow. And we gutted all the way back. Now, we used the 17-ounce Norwegian jig and four bugs that looked like sand eels, mm -hmm. green and white, with a hook in them. We were getting three at a time. Wow. Three at a time. That must have been fun. Yeah, well, you know, we, oh, it was. You know, we didn't use a hand like uh, you and I did. Yeah, yeah. We used the butt end of a tuna rod for the reel. Okay, yeah. I'll show them to you out back yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, we used those in the rod holder, stick in the rod holder, and we dropped the jig over and they go right at the bottom, and then we start jigging. When we figured we had more than one, two or three, and we crank them right up like a winch, right up the side of the boat. Mm. And then we yank them right over the rail. And every time we went, and we never went unless he went, and we went out of Oyster River Boat Yard where Roger Phipps, uh, Bob's son, was a mechanic there. Mm -hmm. He went to tech school and went right over there. Now he's in Florida, and he put the last engine in that boat for me. Okay. Uh, we we had Bob's boat there, you know? And uh, another good thing, too, was when we came in, we could gas up at their pumps, and they only charged us what they paid for it, which was nice. Mm -hmm. So we go out, and we were like right on the edge of the steamship lanes when we were doing this. And uh, we were in like 130 feet of water. Okay, well now, uh, his name was Lee Tom, and the name of his boat was the I'm Alone. 
Scalpa. And every time he went, we went. Mm. And we went right out to him, and we, we did a thing. And the least we ever got was like 1,800 pounds. In like right. two and a half, three hours, max. And with, yeah, three at a time. Mm -hmm. Three at a time. And uh, we, were, we were selling to Old Harbor, this is in 1982. And we took them all to Old Harbor. We pulled our boat right alongside the boat ramp and offloaded everything in the truck and totes over there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they paid us a buck a pound on the hook. We got it all the way back home. We just squatted right down. <laughs> when they cleaning, we just squatted right down. And we came all the way back and uh, and we got it all the way home, you know, to the harbor. So then we took the stuff to Old Harbor. They gave us a waste step around. Two thousand dollars in cash. Bucket mm -hmm. pound. Wow. Yeah. So we did that as long as he did it. And then Bob says, now he says we're going to get the derider ready. We're going sword fishing. So we sword got the fishing or tuna fishing? Huh? Sword fishing? Sword fishing. Oh, wow. I'll okay. show you some pictures, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're sword fishing in South of Martha Vineyard. We get the boat bottom painted, got her in the water, went through the canal. We stayed in Green Pond, and that was a uh, mooring we used from General Augusta that owns Falmouth Lumber. He let us use his mooring. He's a friend of Bob's. And of course, he used to troll for tuna fish. We're harpooning tuna fish. I mean, swordfish. Swordfish, not tuna. Yeah, we yeah. got a couple of tuna, though, too, popping them. Okay, so we're down there. We're going to shake down crews. I'm 70 feet above the waterline on the tower, and Bob is 25 feet beyond the bow on the pulpit. It's all, you know, solid. You're mm. not wiggling. He's right out there with that thing. And you know what? The first day we went out, there was a big boat there from uh, New Bedford. They had a little ultralight. So they'd take the boom and swing him out and drop him in the water. And he'd go cruising along looking, oh, okay. He made a big mistake. When I saw him circling, I knew he was over swordfish. I floored it right down there. We stuck the thing before that boat got there. <laughs> and I did that three times in one day. Because you were faster. Yeah. Huh? You were faster. Yes. We got <laughs> there. We got three fish before they got there. Yeah. So then they got smart. They didn't do that anymore. But we, uh, that month that I fished with him, the swordfish, and we were harpooning them all. They went rod and reel. We stuck a hundred swordfish. 100. Wow. You know what they paid us for them off the boat? $4.65 a pound, and that was 41 wow. years ago. Wow. That was good. Oh, was it? But you know, we had a fish hole that was lined with insulation and tons of crushed ice. And when you got the fish, cut the head off, tails, all the stuff, fins, and, and gutted them, and the hose that it was salt water, the chest cavity out real good, there's no blood or anything in there. And then we put them, lay them in the fish hole and packed them right up with ice. Mm. And needless to say, I ate a lot of swordfish. Mm. And I love swordfish. And every night, I'm not a cook, Bob would barbecue a couple of swordfish steaks each, two piece. Mm. And we had all the comforts of home. The boat was beautiful. And I had a Detroit diesel in, had a generator when we were offshore. We had hot and cold running water, heat, shower, cooking, the whole nine yards, mm -hmm. television. And uh, I made a lot of money, had a lot, it was a great experience for me. I mean, I had never seen a swordfish in the water of my life. Mm -hmm. And God, it was so exciting. And this was in the 80s? Pardon me? In the 80s? In the 80s. 1982. That was the year I got through with the oil company. When right. we, did the, we did the jigging cod, and then we right. went the month of June. So we wiped out everything in that area. We had nothing we could find. So Bob said, let's go home and get a little R&R. &R. So we did. <laughs> so we came home, and my friend Jake Brunich, who was a superintendent at Chaquesa Country Club, and a good friend of mine, 
The only guy he had working with him quit and went to Florida. Here it is, Fourth of July weekend. And he got no help. So I went down there. John Depo, who was a friend of mine, told me, get down and see Jake. He's in trouble. I went down there. Jake hired me. I stayed there for 32 years at Jaquessa Country Club. Oh, wow. That's a long time. And I was there for 32 years, and I built everything there is there. And I mean, I built everything. Greens, teas, bridges, ponds, irrigation. I did it all. And now the National Seashore is going to destroy it. They're closing them down for two years. And when they open it up again, it'll never open again because all the members will go to the captains and Brewster. So you can Kiss that place goodbye. They're flooding the whole area. That's is right. What they're doing, right? That's right. I'll show you some pictures of that that I got that I've taken down through the years at Turquesta when I worked there. Yeah. I got me rowing to the sick green and getting out in the middle of the sick green. Hmm. That's the truth. It's a, it's a, I mean, I feel so bad about that because I mean, all that work that I did and these people and they they just they're a bunch of liars and the poor guy. That's a new manager. He didn't realize that they lied to him. I said, you know, Barry, his name is Barry McLaughlin. He just started two years ago. I said, Barry, these people speak with a forked tongue. Don't you understand that? Why do they want to uh, flood? They flood want it? to go back to its natural beauty. Well, who? So now you have. Uh, Moby Dick, right up into the highway, it was a mm -hmm. great wrestling. I mean, they do more business than anybody out there. Yeah. Okay, you know where his septic system is? Right in the marsh, right in back of his restaurant. So that salt water's got to come up there and flood that, he's going to be out of business, too. Oh, wow. And I am savage in plain English about that. That, is, that just makes me feel so bad. And I mean, I, I left uh, Chiquasset, I went to... Uh, I left there and went to Highland Links for four years. And I caddied there when I was 12. It was in my backyard. And the unfortunate thing is their equipment was junk. And uh, after the uh, triplex green mower died on me six times in the middle of the second green in, on a Saturday and Sunday morning, because I was the little man on a totem pole to be there. And of course I knew the superintendent for 30 years. He used to come over and borrow tools for me at Chicosset. So they hired me. When I left there, I went down and they paid me more money. But it, I, mean, I spent more time on my back underneath the machine than I did mowing. And it got to me, I mean, six times. I mean, this is ridiculous. So I said, you know, this is my last year. And uh, Stewie said, oh, geez, you can't leave me with the friends of years. I said, it's nothing to do with you, Stewie. It's the management. They have junk for equipment. They buy junk at these auctions. And you have to rebuild them before you can even use them. I said, I can't stand it anymore. I don't need it at 80 years old. So I left. I went to Oceaneers. I went down there. They hired me. Gave me more money. And I've been there for five years. Well, I've been doing this for 41 years. And, you know, the pesticide didn't kill me yet. <laughs> what I do is I drink an eight-ounce glass every couple of days and that nullifies it. <laughs> but I, I, I really enjoy doing that kind of work. I've done that kind of stuff for that many years and I really enjoy it. And I love to play golf too. Tommy, I gotta ask you, where yep. did you find your arrowheads? Okay. I started digging when I was 12 years old. I used to dig with Ross Moffat, who was a famous artist in Providence down. And his wife was my art teacher at Truro School when I was in the eighth grade. So weekends, uh, I'd meet him down to Pilgrim Spring in North Truro. Okay, we would do this after Labor Day when all the tourists had gone, so they wouldn't know what we're doing. So that side of that slope where the, the campsite is, and right at the foot of the hill, was a spring. I dug stuff out of there. I mean, I'm going to show it to you. Don't don't get away without me showing okay. that stuff to you. This stuff is, a lot of it is crude and a lot of it is better. Now, I have a few uh, in that collection. I went from there, I had to dig over, 
I said, go down Whitman Beach, go up to the top of the hill, take a left and get down the old railroad bed. And there's a valley, like a volcano crater there, and there's a little water hole, there's water supply at the bottom, and on the northwest side, and this is this smart too. These people camped on the northwest side, so the southwest wind would blow at them and cool them off. And the northwest wind would go over their heads. They're in the lee. Now, down at uh, uh, Great Hollows, as I call it, it's down between there and Con Hill, I got some of the most picture perfect arrowheads out of there that you would ever see. I'm going to show them to you. I have a spearhead this long that came out of, I was on Beach Point working with Joe North. I was digging through his lawn, and the lawn was made uh, from a loam that came from when they stripped the side of that hill to the campsite. Well, when I was digging through there to put the cement a walk in, I found a spearhead is perfect. Hmm. I mean, I, I've got some stuff. I got teeth, I got pottery, I got pieces of pottery out of Chiquessa Country Club. I know where there's three campsites there, that, and I'm the only one that knows where they are. And I also, years ago, when I worked for uh, Alex and Priscilla Henderson on Great Island in Wellfleet Harbor, I had written permission to dig there, and I never got back there. And boy, I kicked myself in the rear end for not going there, because I know where there's three sites out there that haven't been touched. And the National Park, don't, they don't even know where they are. I know where they are. So uh, I dug a couple of pieces. I got a couple of pieces off of Lieutenant's Island out that way, too. But um, uh, I, uh, I got Camden interested in uh, digging, too. So I was telling Cam, I said, you know, Cam, and I, 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 this is my theory, that when the pilgrims came here and get water out of that spring, the Indians had long gone. The Indians are there. Do you think they'd let the pilgrims steal the water? I don't. Another thing, here in East Dam, first encounter beach, this is my theory on this one. In the old days, up inside of Boat Meadow and all that marshland was not mm -hmm. there. That was open to Cape Cod Bay. Mm -hmm. but when the pilgrims were exploring up there in a shell, 30-foot rowboat with a mast in it, they went up inside there and came right over in this direction, right over to where the road exists today going down. And they pulled up right there, got out and went up over the hill into that valley, and that is where First Encounter was right there. There, and I'll show it to you. And I'm sure that's where the Indians fired the arrows <coughs> into the campsite. Hmm. And I know where there's uh, Tomahawk Trail, mm -hmm. the bike, the bike trail. Right. That was loaded with arrowheads. When I was delivering oil, uh, Mike Roach's gang and we had this uh, contract to sell them fuel. I stole that away from when I left the grain store. But anyways. Um, that place was loaded, and a lot of times, I know Paul Donovan, who was into uh, arrowheads, he got a bunch of stuff out of it. When they were putting the trail through, he got a lot of stuff. You know, there was another lot of stuff on the side of the bank at Hemingway, too. Hmm. It's up there. Donald Fulcher told me about that one. He, was, he used to be the state game warden. He did now, too, I think. He was a little bit older than me. Anyways, um, there's a pile, and I, I, what I should do, I should go and see them at the National Seashore and see if I could dig. I know where there's a pile that came that they, when they built the thing, they scooped all it up and took it and piled it in a yard that belongs, a house that belongs to the National Seashore. I would like to go over there and go through that mound. Hmm. Even if I give them the stuff. I would love to see. Right. And I'm, sh I'm sure there's some stuff in there. Where's this? It's down on Tomahawk Trail. Tom you go in, on the right hand side is the house, just as you come onto the trail. And in that yard is a big mound of stuff that they mm -hmm. took out of Tomahawk Trail. Mm -hmm. If you went through that, I guarantee that you're going to find some Indian artifacts. I know they will. I know they will.
Yeah. And you know, I came back last year from Florida, and I wanted to see the stuff that they dug when the when the campsite was exposed in front of Nauset Coast Guards on the beach. And you know, I always knew there had to be something over there. Because when I drove an oil to that station for the park, there was a little water hole between there and the beach. I said, boy, at the prime place. Well, we had a week of northeast wind. And when it, it blew out the campsites, and they dug it, they had people come in here and dig it. Mm -hmm. And when they had it in the paper that they found it there, they did a radiocarbon test of that stuff, and it was four thousand years old, not hundred, mm -hmm. thousand. And I want to see that. So I said, Joyce, let's take a ride over the visitor center over here. Let's see, see if they got it on display. I'm going to tell you nothing. So I said to the park ranger, I said, where's the stuff that came from uh, North Coast Guard? Oh, we got it in a building up in South Churro. I said, what good is it there? Who can see it? Who cares if it's up in a building up there? I said, it's like the and years ago, when I was pumping oil in the 70s, and uh, Kenny Rose was doing a Title V down in Cove Road in Wellesley, and they found a mass grave with 30 Indians in that grave. And they put them up there, too. So it's funny. So they called up my house in the middle of the night, National Park. Oh, we're out of oil up here in South Truro. I said, well, I don't think those guys are going to feel it because they did already. Because that's where the 30 Indians were stirring up. <laughs> yeah. They don't got a freezer to run. <laughs> but that was true. And, but I, I really believe that right here, that the, you, you take a ride down there someday. Yeah. You go up that little road that says Pilgrim Path, up the hill, up and over. You go out a little bit, and there's a valley. Low spot. That for the camp. Hmm. I'm sure. I, I stake my life on it. I'm so sure of that. But i got to show you my Arrowhead collection. Oh, you must. And so. you know what I'm doing? I'm willing that to my grandson. That's nice. his. That boat's going to be his the fruit in May. Yep. Fruit to May. Should we stop the camera and mm -hmm. have Tommy collect some and maybe start it up? And so I'm going to thank you one more time yeah. before I stop this. Yeah, this right. has been fascinating, yeah. Tom. Just right. fascinating. I have a rare and memory that doesn't quit. You know? <laughs> Maybe I'm an extra terrestrial. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. And how old are you now? I am 89. 89. And this coming March, you'll be 90. 90. March 30th. You know something? I have a game that day. They'll sing happy birthday to me for the sixth time. I'll show you the little plaque they gave me. Down in Florida? Yeah. Oh, well, that's nice. Like, see, I, I, uh, I don't do Boston. I do right. Florida. Yeah. Spring training only. That's great. And I told them last spring they wouldn't even be a wild card player, and I was right again. <laughs> <laughs> this is the end I would love of to manage the Red Sox. part oh. two.